Good morning, and I hope you're having a, a great day, kind of staying dry a little bit. But either way, God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. Amen. The gospel prospers during the good times and the bad. Oftentimes more in the bad times, because that's when we can step back and take a look around and realize we need God. That He can control things that we cannot control, and thank goodness His ways are better than our ways. If you'll turn your Bibles on or open them up to Mark in, ch in chapter 5, verse 21, Lord willing, we're going to go all the way through verse 43 and finish the chapter this morning. And we've got a sermon title, Christ-like Leadership Qualities. A few things that you can learn this morning. And I think that a lot of us, if we're not careful, we, we, we hear about leadership and we think, well, I'm not really a leader. Well, I hate to tell you this, but you don't have have an option on whether or not you're a leader. Several months ago, seven or eight months ago, you heard me tell you that leadership is influence. Have you ever understood it to be that way? Now, some of us have the opportunity uh, and the responsibility more than the opportunity. Maybe you have people that work for you, and maybe you have some type of influence over
over their financial situation. But at the same time, some of your greatest improvements and most important things you've done in life are because of your leadership on influence and with influence on the people that are just standing shoulder to shoulder next to you in life. You're influencing them in positive ways to live a better life, a more Christ-pleasing life. And I give this example, you know, you have a buddy and they're not doing right and they're continually not doing right. Nothing is more impactful than one Christian saying to another Christian in love, but also just in truth saying, you know what, hey man, you're out of line. You're not right about this. You got to check yourself. You got to rethink this because it's not going the way that God would have it go. And for that person to say, be able to take a deep breath and say, you know what, you're right. You're right, I'm, I'm not being who God has created me to be. I'm not obeying him the way that I should obey him, and I need to change. You see, in that relationship and in that situation, there is no hierarchy, but at the same time, leadership took place. Leadership is influence, and you have influence over people, whether you like it or not. Now, we can take it to another step, and we can talk about good leadership. Now, good leadership is when you have influence over someone, but you put someone else in the absolute best possible scenario for them to succeed. You know, some of y'all help me in order to lead this church, and we have lots of things going on here. I don't know that we really do enough self-commercials for our church. We hosted Ranger Day for the Cub Scouts. We, we, we sit there, and we go out there, and we feed elementary school staff. We feed people on Monday night. Anybody in our community that wants to eat a warm dinner, Brother Tony leads that. This coming Wednesday night, 515, anybody that wants to come, come and eat a free dinner, and it'll be the best food you put in your mouth all week. I guarantee it. And then at 6 o'clock, we have First Wednesday worship, one hour of praise and worship music where Brother Barry, our praise team, and then some people from the outside come and lead us in an hour of worshiping through music on the first Wednesday of every month. We have things going on. We have our food pantry from 9 until about 11 or 11.30, Tuesdays and Thursdays. Hundreds of families are taken care of. And you know, I do have to spend time preparing sermons during the week, but you want to talk about some pressure to have good leadership, man, do all of this and make sure that it's really doing, we're doing everything to point people to Christ. And that's what we want. We want people and you want people that you have influence over to be in the best scenario possible to successfully put them in situations that will lead them to Christ. That's good leadership for the saints. So we have that that I want us to know because today we're going to look at some Christ-like leadership qualities. But there's something else I want you to know. There's going to be two characters, really a few characters, but two main characters today in the passage as we finish Mark chapter 5. There's going to be this man named Jairus, and he was the elder in the synagogue. And remember, the synagogue was the local place where the, the Jews would come and meet if they couldn't get to Jerusalem to the temple. And so he's the elder there. He's, he's kind of highfalutin. He, he's got some money and prestige and some power, and he would have been looked up to. And Jesus is going to be in a situation, and he's going to provide great leadership for Jairus and his 12-year-old daughter, his little girl. Now, this is I want you to know this on the front end. At age 12, she would have become a woman in that culture so she was a full full adult but Jairus still looked at her as his little girl but then so we have all of the power and the prestige and the religiosity of the elder of the synagogue but then we also have this lady that for 12 years herself has had a bleeding disease and because of their Jewish rules and regulations she hasn't been able to go to the synagogue and worship her family wouldn't get too close to her because they would be unclean for at least a week she has spent all of her money we know from the other gospel accounts of this story she has no more money she's run out of doctors to go get second third and fourth opinions from all of these things. And I want you to know, no matter which side of the coin you're on, if you are the richest person in this room, if you have the nicest car, I don't know of anybody that drives a Bentley, so if you have the best Bentley that has ever been built, or if the other side of it, you walked here in the rain, and your clothes stink, and you're not comfortable, and you're ill, and you don't have a pot to warm water in or anything else I'm telling you Jesus loves you he cares for you trust him and he will provide ladies and gentlemen no matter where you are in that great expanse between one type of person and another Jesus made time because he was the greatest leader to ever live 
So with this, you need to be reachable, number one. Mark chapter 5, verse 21 through verse 24, if you'll follow along with me. Now, when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, you know what, let me, let me just cover this real quick. What a two or three, if Mark's writing chronologically, so in time order, what a crazy two or three days this has been for Jesus and the apostles. Everything is going, going great. He teaches these parables. I mean, he's the best teacher ever, and, and he's up here, and he's around Capernaum, but he, he decides that he withdraws, and they hop in these little boats, and they're going across the Sea of Galilee over to the east side of the sea. This crazy storm comes, and Jesus literally calms the storm and calms the sea right there. They get over to the east side of the sea and at least 2,000, maybe up to 6,000 demons have possessed this guy or two. Jesus casts them out. The pigs run in to the water off the cliff and they're drowned and then they're pushed away and rejected. So they get back in the boat and here they go across because Jesus wants to go back to the east side of the lake again. Can you imagine? I remember when I was in college, I pledged a fraternity and in the last week of our pledge, a pledge semester, we weren't able to really go to sleep for a week and by about day four I didn't know which way was up which way I was to go I was just totally just confused and didn't know what was going you could say hi Jay and I just start crying like I don't know I don't know I don't know if I should say hi back or not I don't I don't know and so that's what these apostles have gone through this whirlwind of oh my goodness and remember when they were in the boat and they were saying to Jesus Hey, man, you should get up here and panic with us because we're all about to die. And Jesus steps up and he wakes up from his nap and says, hey, be still. That's when they realized and they feared, saying, no more is this some great teacher. No more is this just some guy that was sent from God. No more is this some prophet that maybe will have a good word for us. No, this is God in the boat with us. Woo! Man, what a couple of days for these old boys. But Jesus was reachable. Back to verse 21. Now when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him, and he was by the sea. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name, and when he saw him, he fell at Jesus' feet and begged him, implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter, who by that culture was a woman, my little girl, eyes at the point of death, come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed and she will live. So Jesus went with him, and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. Jesus, through all this time, was reachable. I want to tell you something. As you think about Christ-like leadership, though, if you went back and read the same account in Luke chapter 8, you would know this. When Jesus was on the east side of the Sea of Galilee, he had just cast out at least 2,000 demons, maybe 6,000 demons. They had seen this miraculous change in the demon-possessed man. And the people in that culture, all of those people that saw it and were told about it immediately, they said, get out of here. We don't want anything to do with you. It is going to be the same thing for you as you spread the word of Jesus Christ, as you exert influence over other people. There are going to be people that are stiff-necked. There are going to be people that reject. There are going to be people that push back against you and you have to say okay I want you to understand this it has always been in God's plan for people to reject him if their hard hearts so desire and he was rejected and he and he just left but then I want you to know this about Christ-like leadership too when he gets back on the east side of the lake on the Sea of Galilee they're so excited and they're waiting to be with him and hear from him and I want you to know that when you get rejected when people say no I don't want to hear anything about this Jesus I don't want to I don't want to have salvation I'm not worried about it anything else then you can understand that you can pray for that person God might change their heart in the long run but there will be some somebody on the other side of the lake that wants to receive salvation because of faith in Jesus Christ. And when Jesus got to the other side of the lake, he was received well and people wanted to have a piece of him. So rejected by one, received by another. You know, Jairus already mentioned that he'd have been a wealthy man with lots of prestige and power, and he falls at Jesus' feet. He's willing to lose all that he's got. You know, he's not going to be the ruler of the synagogue much longer once all the people say, oh, no, no, he's changing. He's following this Jesus guy. 
that's already claimed to be God. Lose everything he's got for his little girl. You know, I think it's odd that this week is the week that we're doing this. Because I have a daughter of my own, and Boog turned 18 this week. By our world and culture standards, she became an adult. But can't you see yourself in Jairus' spot? I don't care what the culture says. And at some point in your own life and in your friend's life, they're going to have to get to a point where they say, I don't care what the culture says. I've got to do what God says do. And God told Jairus, fall at the feet. And I'm telling you, even though my daughter is become of age, which doesn't mean what it used to mean, by the way. But she and I were talking about this. You know what, when you're 18 now, I think if you're a guy, you have to register, you know, for a selective service. And I think you can buy lotto tickets. That's all you can do. You can't even go buy a pack of smokes. The, uh, you know, when I was 18, I went and bought a pack of cigarettes, and I, I tried to burn one down, and I coughed it all up and was just making a fool of myself. I threw them away. I haven't bought another pack since. But the, uh, <laughs> well, it wasn't really an addiction. But now you've got to wait to 21 to be able to do some of the cool stuff. The, uh, which I don't know what the other cool stuff is. I'm just saying, like, I'm just saying, like, the world would say it's cool stuff. Not, not your preacher, not Jay. Um, <laughs> Anyway, the, uh, so you have to be available, and Jesus was available. Jairus, wealth, power, prestige, forget what the world says. I'm going to do what's right. I'm coming to God. The next thing is that you've got to be able to prioritize. You know, as I was reading Wearsby and MacArthur and all these big-name theologians on this stuff, I don't think they put enough emphasis on this. Jesus was able to prioritize. Verse 25 through 34. Now a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up. And she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone from him, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? But his disciples said to him, You see the multitude thronging, pressing, almost violently against you, and you say, Who touched me? Let me tell you something. Jesus knew exactly who had touched him, but he was given this lady who, who could approach him. He was available. He gave her some priority right here because she's going to be able to go and have a testimony forever about what Jesus did for her. And I want to challenge you. Make sure you know your testimony so that when you're out there in the real world, you can go out there and you can tell everybody what Jesus did for you just like this lady's going to be able to do. Who touched me? And he looked around to see her. Who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and said to Jesus the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Folks, Jairus, the guy with the power, the guy with the money, the guy with, that the culture said was cool, Jesus was going with him. And you know Jairus was in a hurry. His daughter was about to die, and he had his faith in Jesus, and he wanted Jesus to hurry up and get to his house. But Jesus, as a leader, was able to prioritize, I will get to where I'm going with you, but right now I've got to help this lady right here that's on the other end of the socioeconomic spectrum. And Jesus turned, and he has this conversation. I want to point out a couple of things. This is important. If we break down in the original languages and in, 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 the, in the Greek that these things were written, it makes it very clear that Jesus says to this lady about her faith, you have been made well. And that what he was really saying is that she had been made whole. She had received salvation because of her faith. And then at the end of it, he says, go and be well. And when you read that in the original language, it's going to tell you that, oh yeah, by the way, because you've been made whole because of your faith, your eternity has been sealed because you put faith in me. Guess what? I've healed your disease as well. And now in a couple weeks, you're going to be back worshiping God in the synagogue. You're going to be able to go tell your family all about me and what I did on your behalf. And your life is going to be better forever. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got to be like the woman when we get touched by Jesus. 
So he was able to prioritize. If you're a leader, you better be able to prioritize. Verses 35 through 40. He was unflappable. You know, I had a middle school basketball coach. A boy named Matthew on our middle school basketball team made free throws at the end of a game to win the game for us. Next day in PE class, Coach Davis said, Matthew, I was impressed. How do we step up and make those free throws to win the game for us? Matthew was, you know, just, you know, yes, sir, whatever. He said, some people would say that you're cool as a cucumber. We've all heard that one, but Coach Davis had another line for the same thing. He would say, you're as cool as the other side of the pillow. You ever done that when you're sleeping? You're hot and maybe the head's sweaty and all this stuff. So how does that happen? You know, you would think it's against the bed it would be hot, but that other side's always cool. But cool as the other side of the pillow, Jesus was, and he was unflappable. Let's read this right here now, 30, 35 through 40. While Jesus was still speaking, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not be afraid, only believe. And he permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, who were his inner circle, okay? Andrew at times as well, Peter's brother, but those three guys were Jesus' inner circle throughout his ministry. And he permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. Then Jesus came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and saw a tumult, saw just chaos, all right, ridiculousness. And those who wept and wailed loudly, when he came in, he said to them, why make this commotion and weep? This child is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him. But when he had put them all outside, he took the father and the mother of the child and those who were with him and entered where the child was lying. So here's the picture for you. Jairus is already, here's the story, Jairus is probably already like starting to wonder because, come on, we're wasting time. My daughter's dying and you can heal her. And Jesus stops and, and has priority with the lady with the blood disease and with the bleeding problem. And so here they're coming to the house. Don't bother Jesus anymore. There's nothing you can do. Your daughter has died. And Jesus said, no, 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 no. No, no, this is going to be okay. And if you look at what Jesus really said in the original language, what he was saying and what he said to Jairus was, Journey wrote a hit song off of this. Anybody like Journey, the band? Jesus really said to him, don't stop believing. That's what he said. He was walking, and, and really what he said was, you have believed, now keep it up. Okay. But I think that Journey knew that, and they were biblical scholars, and that's how they got their song. <laughs> the, but sure enough, here he is. Don't stop believing. Jesus just keeps on going to his house. And then he gets there. And it's craziness, and it's chaos. And there in this time, in this culture, in this Jewish world, they had professional mourners. And they would hire people to come and just hoot and holler and go nuts and act all crazy and everything. But that proves that she was really dead. They wouldn't have, now his wife, Jairus' wife and extended family, wouldn't have paid these people to come to their house unless they knew that the girl was really dead, right? No matter how rich you are, you don't waste money and just throw it away, especially on professional wailers and mourners. So they're wailing and they're going crazy. She's so dead that when Jesus says, oh, no, 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 it's going to be okay, that they laugh and make fun of Jesus. And Jesus, he's unflappable during this situation. What Jesus does is he, he says, if you read Luke's account, he says, shut up and leave. Just shut up and leave. I don't think he was necessarily mean. I don't think he was necessarily crass. I think he was just like, this is stupid. I'm the one in charge shut up and leave. And he takes his three closest, James, John, and Peter, and he takes her parents, and they go in there. Of course, it kind of proves that he had a lot of money because a lot of people just had one room in their house in this time in Galilee. And there was multiple rooms, if you read all of this. And they went in there to where this little girl was. Jesus didn't get shook. And if you're going to be a Christ-like leader, and you do have influence, I promise you, you have to be stable and you have to be unflappable. Verses 41 through 43. Giving and loving. Isn't Jesus surely giving and loving? Then Jesus took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha kumai, which is translated, that's Aramaic. That, Aramaic that's the language they spoke 
Okay, now Jesus, the apostles, they would have also probably been able to speak Greek. They would have been able to speak and, and read some Hebrew. But just in their everyday life, it was Aramaic, which is translated, little girl, I say to you, arise. Immediately the girl arose and walked, for she was 12 years of age. And they were overcome with great amazement. But Jesus commanded them strictly that no one should know it and that something should be given her to eat. Jesus is giving and loving. He just brought this girl back to life. He loved Jairus and saw his faith. He loved and cared about this little girl. There were five witnesses, and there really only had to be two or three to prove that something had occurred beyond a shadow of a doubt or in the court of law. Jesus covered his basis. No time for chaos, no time for silliness. I've got this. And in your own life, even though it might not turn out the way you want it to, I promise you, Jesus is saying at times when you bring him all of your panic and all of your worry, he's saying, will you just shut up? <laughs> Trust me. Yeah. I've got this. Yeah. But Jesus is giving. Give her something to eat. She's probably been sick for weeks, if not more. She needs some strength now that she's alive again. But you know, when I think of Boog, even though she's a lady now, right? And I think of Jairus. And even though it was 12, she was a lady. I can't help but think about that constant love of a parent for their child. We want what's best for them. Now, we don't know what caused this. This little girl might have, she might have done something stupid that caused it, right? Kids do stupid stuff. Guess what? We don't like to admit it, but us adults do too. We do as well. But what hits me is how Jesus thought and referred to this 12-year-old. Little girl. Little daughter. I want you to know. No matter how old and big and bad and wise you are, God sees you the same way when, when you're right there in the bed and you're struggling. He loves you, and there sometimes is, there, there are consequences, and, and sometimes God's wrath does become evident, but God loves you. He cares about you. He wants what's best for you, and he is always going to be giving and loving at the end of the day. Don't ever forget that you get to worship and love and be indwelt with a God just like Jesus was. And when you're leading folks, you can't always be mean and hard. I've made that mistake plenty in my life. Sometimes when you're leading folks, you just got to love them and do what's best for them even if they don't realize what's best for them. But how is this going to change your life? One thing that I want you to know is that Jesus responds to faith. Both of these people, Jairus with his daughter, the woman who got there and just wanted to touch his clothes, they had faith in him. And when you have faith in Jesus, he responds. He responds in a way that he knows will be best for you forever and ever and ever. So when the going gets tough, know that if you keep the faith that Jesus has got it. Because he always responds to faith. And the next thing I want you to not lose sight of as you leave is that as you have influence over others and as you are wanting to show good leadership, especially in your relationships that deal with the kingdom of God, you've got to be available. You have to be interruptible and be able to prioritize. You've got to be unflappable when it gets all crazy and everyone else is losing their stinking mind. And you have to be charitable even when people don't deserve it. Do these things and you'll be like Jesus. Thank you.
his face shine upon you and be gracious to you.